Good morning, everyone. It is so good to hear the sound of voices under the age of 12 again in here with us on Sunday morning. I want to invite you all to stand as we worship our God. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. beginning today through the Gospel of Luke as we prepare for Easter Sunday two weeks from today. And so to prepare us for those thoughts, we're going to watch a four-minute video from the Gospel of Luke uh, to uh, help us to focus on the final hours of Jesus' life. So we're walking through the gospel, and we've reached the end of Jesus' long road trip to Jerusalem. He's arrived. So he rides a donkey down the Mount of Olives towards the city, and all these crowds are forming, and people are singing, Praise the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're laying down their cloaks in front of him. The wildest royal tree. Okay, so Israel's ancient prophets promised that one day God himself would arrive and rescue his people and rule the world. Other times the prophet spoke about a coming king who would ride into Jerusalem to bring justice and peace. So Jesus is activating all his hopes that he's that king, and everyone's accepting. Well, not everybody. The religious leaders, they think Jesus is a threat to their power, and so they're not happy. But even more striking, Jesus himself is distraught. He's actually weeping as he rides. Yeah, why? Well, Jesus can see what is coming. He knows that he will be accepted as his and he knows that Israel will keep going down the destructive path, neglecting the poor, stirring up rebellion against the Roman oppressors, and he knows that it will lead to death in the place of harm. And it drives him. The first thing he does in Jerusalem is march into the temple courts and drive out the money changers, disrupting the entire sacrificial system. 
Yeah, he's staging a prophetic protest, and he stands in the center of the courtyard, shouting out words from Israel's ancient prophets. This is supposed to be a place of worship, but you've made it a den of rebels. A den of rebels? Yeah, he's quoting from the prophet Jeremiah, who stood in this same spot, the center of Israel's religious and political power. And he offered the same critique of Israel's leaders, that they're rebellious and and then he gave the message and started planning how to kill him. Which is no surprise to Jesus. In fact, he planned that all of this would happen during the Passover. This is the Holy Week where Jewish people celebrate their ancient story of how God liberated them from slavery and invited them into a covenant relationship. And so Jesus uses the symbols of Passover to reveal the meaning of his kind of death. The broken bread was his broken body. And the wine was his blood that would establish a new covenant relationship between God and Israel. Jesus was going to die for his people and open up a new way forward. After the meal, Jesus takes his disciples to a garden to pray. And he struggles with the very human desire to save his life instead of sacrificing him. But he overcomes this temptation. And it's here where the religious leaders with the temple guards find him and arrest him. Now, Jerusalem was being ruled by the Roman Empire, and so the temple leaders couldn't execute Jesus without permission from the Roman governor, a man named Pontius Pilate. And so they make up this charge that Jesus is a rebel king, stirring up revolution against the Roman emperor. Pilate asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers, you say so. So Pilate can see that Jesus is an innocent man, and he does deserve death. But the leaders keep insisting that he is dangerous, so they negotiate a conference. Pilate will release an actual rebel against Rome, a man named Barabbas, instead of Jesus. And so the innocent is handed over in the place of the guilty. Jesus is taken away with two other accused criminals and nailed to a Roman execution device. And people are mocking him. Hey, if you're the Messianic king, save yourself and us. But Jesus loved his enemies to the very end, offering hope to one of the criminals dying beside him. And he even prayed for his executors. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then the sky darkened as an innocent man died to death. And then Jesus cried out with ancient words from Israel's songs. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then Jesus died, innocent. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. Only some.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Reading this morning will be from Psalm 126, verses 1 through 6. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carry seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Let us pray. Eternal God in heaven, we give great thanks for your love and your kindness. We thank you for all that you have given to us, dear Lord. No matter how big or how small, it first came from you, and we thank you for giving us those blessings. We ask you to bless those here this morning, and we ask those that could, could not be with us this morning, dear Lord, that you also bless them. Help us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You will notice a lot of changes in our worship order this morning. Uh, coming up is, is one of those. Uh, we, we think it's really important to celebrate the Lord's Supper together as a complete body of believers. And so we want to do that while all of us are assembled here together. So let's sing this song, How Great the Father's Love, and then we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper together. <coughs> Verses 33 through 42. 
Here, another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers, and he went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took its servants, beat one, killed one, and killed another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these vine dressers? They said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably, and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers, who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son that you sent to us, that he may be the perfect sacrifice for us, Lord. We just thank you for the grace and the love that you showed us by giving us Jesus, Lord, and for the sacrifice that he made and the love he showed by dying on the cross for our sins. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. <coughs> Heavenly Father, just thank you for the blood that your, shuts, that your son's shed on the cross for our sins, Lord. I just pray that we go out throughout our week and remember that sacrifice you made, that we may go out and serve others and love one another in the same way that you loved us. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
something we haven't said in a long time. It is now time for our kids to be dismissed to their classes. So if you are between the ages of two and fifth grade, um, oh sorry, teen, I was just looking at the thing. Okay. Two years through teenagers, you may go at this time and let's uh, let's all sing them sing them out to their classes. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. something else that's a little bit new today as a lot of you know over the past uh, over the past several weeks we've been uh, preparing for a praise and harmony workshop that was held both here and in Georgetown a couple of weeks ago and so we learned a number of things some of them are, are subtle you may not notice so much others are will be will be more noticeable one of the things that that we want to do is to to make a concerted effort to to introduce new songs to the church we, we still love old songs, the old classic hymns, and we'll continue to sing those just as we're doing today. But we also want to recognize that, that God is continuing to work among us and that that calls forth new songs of praise uh, from, from us. And so we're going to uh, do that today using a three-step process that we, uh, that we all experienced during the workshop. So what's going to happen here is um, you're going to see the slides up on the screen with the music and they'll have the, the four parts that you're accustomed to seeing up there. The soprano, the higher women's voices, alto, lower women's voices, tenor for, for, and bass for, for men's voices. And what we're going to do the first time through, we're going to play a track. Uh, it, it's actually a training track with where there will be four people singing, one with each of the four voices. So hopefully you'll be able to find a, uh, a slot that, that's comfortable to you and, uh, and, and, and sing, and well, actually the first time through, don't sing with that, okay? The first time through, we're just going to listen, okay? So we're gonna introduce this new song with a backing track, with slides, so you can see the music, you can hear the four, the four parts, the four voices, and just listen, okay? That's the first time through. The second time through, uh, we're going we're gonna to do basically the same thing again, only this time we want you to just sing quietly to yourself. Not, not loud, just sing quietly to yourself. Try to follow along with, with what you're hearing there. And then finally, the third time, we'll have the group back up here and we'll do it through together just as we would normally. So this is the first time that we have done this. I hope, sincerely hope and pray it's going to be a, a blessing for our church as we... Uh, as we try to continually refresh our praise and worship to God. Okay, you ready up there, Rachel? All right, Rachel has given me a thumbs up, so we are ready to roll. All right, so first time through, just listen, okay? Just listen. Don't sing, just listen. <laughs>
It's a beautiful song, isn't it? Um, so what we're going to do now is it's a pretty simple song from a, from a structural standpoint. There's nothing, no echoing. There's no, it's pretty much just sing straight through. There are four verses followed by four choruses, and then you repeat the chorus after the final verse. So nothing, nothing too difficult to, uh, to do there. So now what we're going to, now what we're going to do is the second time through, I want you to just sit there and as the, as the, uh, as the track plays, just sing quietly uh, to yourself. Uh, in a part, if you're if you're so inclined, uh, but just uh, just sing along quietly to yourself, and then we will uh, let's see how that goes. All right, whatever you're. On. Let's all stand and worship with full voices together.
sorry, really quickly. You may be seated. The Lord loves to hear us sing praises to Him. And thank you for bringing your praise to God. Just as Israel rejected God as king in the days of Samuel, so Israel rejected God as king in the days of Jesus. And just as David would not force himself on the throne as long as King Saul was alive, so Jesus would not force himself on the throne in Jerusalem. Unlike every other kingdom of the earth that is established typically with power, by force, and through coercion and manipulation, Jesus would establish his kingdom through crucifixion and through death. For centuries, Roman Catholics have celebrated prior to Easter a tradition called the Stations of the Cross, a series of depictions of Jesus' journey from the court with Pilate to Calvary or Golgotha itself. At each of these 16 stations is a, a painting, a portrait, or a sculpture depicting that particular turn of event in Jesus' life as he walks towards Calvary. Some of you have actually probably walked the Via Della Rosa, the very steps that Jesus took from Pilate's courtyard to Calvary. But for the many Christians who will never make a pilgrimage there, the Stations of the Cross was developed to, to help us to see with our eyes and experience with our hearts uh, the final hours of Jesus' life. Now, five of those 16 Stations of the Cross are not found in the Bible. So the Protestants developed their own 16 Stations, all of which are biblically based. And so as you move from station to station to station, you stop. You stare, you think, and you pray. When I entered the 9-11 Museum in Manhattan several years ago, I was first greeted with still pictures from that day's tragic events. The faces filled with confusion and horror as they watched and witnessed what was happening around the Twin Towers. I knew right then at the very beginning of my tour that this would be unlike any other museum tour I'd ever been on. It seemed sacrilegious to, to talk out loud or to carry on conversations with people you were with as you moved through that museum. It seemed only appropriate that at each turn in the museum I should stop Stare, think, and even pray. Roman Catholics weren't the first to feel the same way about the last hours of Jesus' life. Long before then, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John developed their own stations of the cross because they wanted you and I to soak in these final hours of Jesus' life. And so today, for the next two Sundays leading up to Easter, we'll work through Luke's Stations of the Cross. Now Luke was a doctor by trade. He was also the Apostle Paul's traveling companion. He was not an eyewitness to Jesus himself, but, but Luke did become the church's earliest historian. Through methodical research, through personal interviews with those who did know Jesus, uh, Luke then, inspired by God, wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And so this morning, we're going to pick up with Luke's first station of the cross in Luke 22, beginning at verse 39. Jesus went out, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, 
and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Jesus is here. The disciples are here, but only focus on Jesus. Stop and stare and think. What, what do you see? I see Jesus' concern for his friends. He repeatedly implores them to pray rather than to sleep because he doesn't want them to fall into temptation. He's worried about what will happen to them if they do. Jesus, so to speak, has a terminal illness. And he's still trying to help his friends. Stare at that for a moment. Do you see also Jesus' concern for himself? He prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. This cup is a metaphor for the physical and or spiritual suffering that Jesus will experience during his death. It's a nasty cup. It's an awful tasting cup that Jesus would prefer the Father to remove from the menu of his life. Jesus is concerned about himself here. A few years ago, NBA basketball superstar Kevin Love wrote an article for a magazine describing his own personal battle with anxiety and panic attacks, sometimes uh, which actually happened on the court as he was playing ball. He, he titled his article, Everybody is going through something. Even millionaires like Kevin Love, even retirees, even teenagers, everybody is going through something. Luke wants you to stop and see that Jesus is going through something. It's, it's why he draws our attention to the angel that was sent to bring him comfort. It's why Luke adds the description of Jesus' sweat like drops of blood. He is filled with anxiety and he is concerned for himself. You're Jesus. Stop and stare at that for a moment. And then finally see Jesus' concern for his Father's will. Now he's at the crossroads here that we are all at pretty much every day of our lives. Choosing between doing God's will, our own will. And here at this crossroads, Jesus chooses God's will. He prays, not my will, but yours be done. This is hard. This is hard to do in any situation. We know how hard it is when we're at the crossroads uh, from deciding between humility and pride or patience or impatience. It's hard to choose God's will over our own will. And yet Jesus chooses the way of the cross over self-preservation because the idea that hurts him most is not doing his Father's will. Stop and stare at that. Think. And then at each station, the leader will lead the group in this prayer that should be on the screen. I say, we adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, and together we say, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The second station follows in Luke 22, verse 47. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, 
Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. There are plenty of parties present at this scene. There's the crowd, there's Judas, there's the twelve, there's the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders, but don't look at any of them. Just look at Jesus at this station. What do you see? How about his lack of surprise? I wonder what went through Judas' mind when Jesus asked the question. Jesus knew Judas' expression of friendship, this kiss, was anything but an expression of friendship. This was Judas's way of putting the target on Jesus so that the arresting officials would know exactly who they were supposed to arrest. But the only one surprised here is Judas. It's not Jesus. Now, now think about this just for a second. You and I, we may displease Jesus, uh, we may please Jesus, but I don't know if we'll ever surprise Jesus. What else do you see? I see what I call consistent compassion. After the Apostle Peter got a little loose with his sword and cut off Malchus's right ear, and you got to love Luke the doctor, very specific details. He wants you to know it was the right ear. Jesus put it back on. And this scene reminded me of the story Josh Compton told me as an army medic in Afghanistan, where as he's trying to save his fellow soldiers' wives in a tent after a firefight, there are also Taliban soldiers in the tent under arrest that he will also have to try to save. That's the consistent compassion. It doesn't matter who you are, we're going to try to save you. I mean, here we see Jesus' consistent compassion. You can be a for me, you can try to arrest and kill me, but I'm always going to be compassionate to you. We need to stare at that. Me, maybe not you, sometimes my compassion is more sporadic than it is consistent. One more thing to see here. How Jesus faces his fears. The thing he wanted removed is now the thing he is facing, something he calls the hour of darkness. Now, do you remember the story in Numbers chapter 21 when after Israel's latest expression of disappointment in and impatient with, impatience with God, God sent snakes into their camp? A number of them got bit. Some of them died. Everyone begged Moses to ask God to call the snakes off. And so God said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten could look at it and live. Again, the old Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, comes back to my little mind when he's peering down in the cavernous hole in the pyramid and says, snakes. Why does it have to be snakes? This pole of a snake. Why does it have to be snakes? Now what we call this today is exposure therapy. Instead of running from your fears, <coughs> you face and confront and are exposed to your fears. My daughter had a fear of talking to people she did not know and so if we were at a restaurant, she would open up her mouth as a, a kid and middle schooler to, to order what she wanted to eat. I, I tried, parents, you know, I tried. Look, if you don't say nothing, you're just going to starve here. And all that just never moved the needle. So this was middle school, and we're driving home from volleyball practice one night. I stopped to pump gas. She asked if she could have something to drink. Now, she knew by then, I, I'm not the kind of guy who spends three bucks on a Gatorade when he's three miles away from home. I'm thinking she was full of herself. She had a really good practice that night. Thought she was like entitled. But you know me. This was my opportunity. Is trying to be a good dad. All right, Liz. 
Here's the money. If you go inside and, and buy it yourself, you can have something to drink. Much to my surprise, she did. <laughs> and when she came back, she was lit up like a Christmas tree. So proud of herself for facing her fears. You need to stop and see Jesus facing his fear here. And so we pray, we adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Our final stop today is in Luke 22, verse 54 through 62. We won't read it. You know it well. Jesus makes a very brief appearance in this station. It's the story of Peter's denial of Jesus while Jesus is being interrogated uh, by the high priest. Now remember, Jesus had had a previous conversation with Peter about this very situation. Jesus said, it's going to happen. Peter said, I'll die before it happens. <coughs> well, guess what? It happened. Now, I'll spend more time on this next week, but I do need to point out what you're seeing here and why Peter feels compelled to tell everybody around him, I don't know Jesus. I've got nothing to do with Jesus. Oftentimes, you and I today focus on the physical pain associated with crucifixion. The gospel writers focus on the mental pain associated with crucifixion, primarily the shame, the humiliation, and the embarrassment associated with crucifixion. And so Peter feels compelled to tell everybody, I don't know Jesus, because it is embarrassing at this point in time to know Jesus. In fact, it may be dangerously embarrassing to be associated with Jesus. And so to avoid any smidge of public humiliation, three times, Peter denies knowing Jesus. And then Jesus briefly enters this scene. Not with a word, you remember, but with a look. You can hear the rooster crow, can't you? And then Luke says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. It's eye contact. Oh, it, it made Peter crumble. He went off and bawled his eyes out. He connected all of the dots. But I was thinking, what kind of look was this? I don't think it was a, I told you so look, or a, how could you look? I'm pretty convinced it was a, I'm worried about you, look. Or, I still love you, look. Stare at Jesus here. As we pray, we adore you, O Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. As we close, however, it's sort of my job to get in your business. And so as we've looked at Jesus, we have to look at ourselves and connect some of the dots. Sometimes it's harder to look at our own lives than it is to look at Jesus's. Catherine Schultz in her book, Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margins of Error, explores why most humans assume and often insist they are right and find it so disconcerting when they realize they're not. And in her book, she asks a very interesting question. What does it feel like to be wrong? Now, listen closely, she's not asking. What does it feel like when you realize you're wrong? That comes later. She's asking, what does it feel like when you are wrong? Before you realize you're wrong. Her answer, it feels just like being right. <laughs> so sure. So confident. It has to be this way. And sometimes we are afraid to look at our own lives because we know we've been wrong or 
we've been numbing ourselves to the reality of how wrong we've been that we, we just don't think about it anymore. Listen, uh, this church is a safe place in which to be wrong and to confess not only your sins but your struggles as well. And so we'll think about the three that Jesus went through. The first is anxiety. Anyone filled with anxiety or fear? Anyone had a panic attack in the last few days? Anyone wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night? Your mind just running constantly over and over and over again? You know, sometimes things can be so buried deep inside of us that we don't even know that they are there. I discovered this uh, when we were a few days from perhaps adopting Liz. We were in the running with a couple of other couples. Liz would be born in two days' time, and they would make their decision. I was 31. I didn't know until that moment how desperately I wanted to be a dad. And it all came crashing down. Friday is my off day. Diane at the time worked at the bank. Got home Friday at lunch. But early Friday morning after she left, I just crumbled. The room spinning, the anxiety and the fear. What if they don't choose us? What if we're not going to be parents? How will, we, how, how will my wife handle this? There was so much anxiety so much fear, just wanting to be chosen, right? Noon was getting closer, and I realized I am in no shape to see my wife through this, and it's my job to see her through this. So I got to the phone, and I called my mother-in-law, who lived four and a half hours away, and said, you got to come right now. We may not find out until Sunday, but I can't take care of your daughter like I'm supposed to. You've got to come and take care of her for me. Whoa. That fear, that anxiety that just floods over us. You need to know if you're living in fear or filled with panic today, Jesus sees you and feels you because he's felt it himself. And then there's the betrayal. Many of us don't like to talk about how we've been betrayed. The family member who abused us. The parent who abandoned us. The spouse who walked out on us. The child now who never calls us. So much betrayal in our world. And if you're feeling Betrayal. Know that Jesus feels it with you. And then finally, the rejection. My heart broke when she said two weeks ago, every person I've ever been interested in dating has rejected me. And I've never been on a date. If you feel the pain of rejection this morning, Know that Jesus sees you. Take courage and see it yourself. This is what I believe with all of my heart as our group takes the stage to lead us in a song of decision. I, I believe this with all of my heart. I believe Jesus can help and heal. I, I, I really do. But he won't until we cry out to him for help. He won't barge through the door of our hearts without our permission. So if you need the healing touch of Jesus to enter in your heart this morning, cry out to him, ask him. We can pray for you together as a family this morning. We can talk with you and listen to you. Or if you're ready to be baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, Meet me down front. Tell me how we can help us. Together we stand and sing. Just as I am with